Good evening. I'm Mike Perry. I'm the executive director of the Army Heritage Center Foundation. The foundation is the friends group for the U.S. Army Heritage Education Center located at uh, the Army War College in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. The center is the largest repository of individual soldier narratives, unit histories, and a research library beyond compare uh, that serves both the United States Army and the public. I'd invite you to visit the center uh, both virtually and in, in person, uh, should you be able to. Tonight's program, um, when I first saw the, uh, the article that it's based upon, uh, was early last summer. And uh, what has changed significantly since last summer? Uh, these gentlemen are going to talk about the first victory of the 21st century against terrorism, uh, specifically focused on their exploits in Afghanistan when we look at what's happened to Afghanistan and our involvement over the past couple of months. So we're, we're actually bookending in some respects the, uh, the events because I think uh, Mark is gonna talk a little bit about uh, his efforts to bring home some of the Afghans uh, who he may have worked with. I'm not gonna go through a long introduction. I'll let Bill and Mark introduce themselves, but at this time I'll turn the floor over to you, Bill and Mark. Okay, um, are my slides up, Mike? Okay. First of all, thank you for having us to discuss our favorite topic, first victory of the 21st century, Mazari Sharif. I'm Bill Nahr, retired Army Colonel, and with me tonight is Mark Nooch, the original horse soldier and former commander of Special Forces Operational Detachment Alpha 595, which is highlighted in this monograph. We will be doing a tag team on tonight's discussion. As you might recognize, this is the notification on tonight's discussion. Again, the publication PDF copy is free through JSAL website. Before we begin, let me repeat the disclaimer that the views expressed here are entirely ours and do not necessarily reflect the views, policy, or position of the U.S. government, U.S. SOCOM, or JSAL, and we are not here representing JSAL. Let me first set the stage. The purpose of the month, I'm losing something here. There we go. Let me first set the stage. The purpose of the monograph was to develop a case study for professional military education. For the case, we thought it was important to get the story right. There are a lot of renditions out there on the horse soldiers, all good, all exciting, but not, not all entirely accurate. So the case in this case study is the story. The study includes the learning objectives and outcomes. In this monograph, it has to do with unconventional warfare and is structured in accordance with the definition and seven phases of unconventional warfare or the acronym UW. At the end, I'll summarize some of the lessons and Mark will provide some reflections. After all, it's been 20 years. Let me talk a little bit about the picture that you see in front of you. The first thing that people saw concerning the military in Afghanistan was the photo at the bottom displayed by Sec Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld at a news conference. There are a number of things the photo reflects, such as the austere conditions, joint combined operations with indigenous forces, horseback transportation among a few. Some of the things you don't see, the incredible air support that includes marathon air to air refueling, sometimes six times for one aircraft as it transits to and from the area and remains on station. Another thing is the log logistics support when this crazy captain asked for, and the crazy captain, Captain Mark Nooch. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Mark. <laughs> Asked for horse feed, saddles, and blankets to support this unconventional war. So what does it mean when they say unconventional warfare? Some terminology, kind of to set the stage. Two types of warfare, traditional and irregular. Traditional warfare generally being those force-on-force -force types of engagements, battles, and campaigns that you would imagine warfare to be and normally conducted with conventional forces against an adversary. A regular warfare is defined as a violent struggle among state and non-state actors for legitimacy and influence over the relevant populations. I mean, the two different the difference here is one is talking about an adversary and the other talks about relevant population, which could include the adversary friendlies and those those populations that are that are on the fence deciding which way to go. It's depicted in the figure on the right and includes counterinsurgency, counterterrorism, foreign internal defense, and unconventional warfare. Unconventional warfare is defined here, and I'm gonna pause. Each time you see an ellipse, I'm gonna pause and insert the story into that. 
Activities conducted, as an example, dropping bombs, providing weapons and ammunition, bringing factions together to enable a resistance movement or insurgency, and in this case, we're talking about the Northern Alliance, to coerce, disrupt, or overthrow a government or occupying power. In this case, we're talking about the Taliban by operating through or with an underground auxiliary and guerrilla force, again, the Northern Alliance, in the denied area. And that denied area, of course, was Afghanistan. And it fits into that, and in, the UW fits into that diagram here at the top. Again, support an insurgency or resistance movement against a hostile nation. Now, who conducts unconventional warfare? Army Special Forces, and Mark will discuss that more later. So where is this denied area? Afghanistan, just very quickly, I'm sure most of you know about Afghanistan, but it's about the size of Texas with 50% of its territory above 6,500 feet. It's landlocked, a contrast of mountainous terrain from the Hindu Kush in the Northeast, extending through Kabul and central Afghanistan, West and Southwest, the areas east of Herat, with the fertile plains in the North, along what they call the Am Amu Darya River and rolling desert and salt flats in the South. The population, and of course, this is a best guess, approximately 33 million people live in Afghanistan. And as indicated here in 2001, that was, they, again, a best guess, 21.6 million people per CIA World Factbook. There are four major ethnicities in the country. Pashtun consi consists of 42% of the population and live mostly in the east and south. The Tajiks with 27% of the population mostly live in the Panjshir Valley north of Kabul. The Uzbeks with 9% live across the northern plains of Afghanistan. And we talk about the Uzbeks across the north there near mazar -e sharif That's who, who uh, primarily who Mark had, uh, had linked up with, with General Dostum. And you see the three figures there with General Dostum Ada, Commander Ada, and Commander Mohekik. Uh, the Hazaris at 9% of the population live in the central mountainous region with some in the north and some in the border areas with Iran. Now we talk about Northern Alliance, we're talking about, and, and we go into more of it in the, in, the, in the monograph describing what that means, but uh, we're talking mostly about General Dostum, Commander Ada, and Commander Mohekik up around the Missouri Sharif area. Language, mostly Afghan, Persian, or Dari, those percentages summed to more than 100% because respondents were allowed to select more than one language. And of course, the religion is overwhelmingly Muslim, uh, with, with, in fact, within that, then 84 to 89% being Sunni and the rest Shia. I'm not going to go into 9-11, uh, in, into what happened during that. I'm gonna, but I'm going to talk immediately following the attacks, the series of White House interagency inter meetings. In my opinion, the most notable was held on 15 September at Camp David, where the CIA and DOD pre presented their plans. As indicated here, the CIA's plan was to focus on Afghanistan and deploy small CIA teams to link up with the Northern Alliance, followed by special forces bringing overwhelming firepower. DOD's approach, supported by Vice President Cheney, was much broader. Under this global terrorist threat, they proposed three priority targets, the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, and Iraq. And of the three argued that Al-Qaeda and Iraq were strategic threats with Iraq being immediate because of its alleged ties to terrorism and its pursuit of weapons of mass destruction. No one else at the meeting to include the Chairman Joint Chiefs of Staff voiced support for the DOD proposal. Colin Powell argued that going after Iraq at the time would be seen by the American people as a bait and switch. Condoleezza Rice characterized it as a huge distraction. According to the Chairman, General Sheldon, there was not one piece of evidence to suggest that Iraq was involved in the 9-11 attacks. Finally, as Wolfowitz tried to, present, tried to press his proposal for Iraq during General Shelton's presentation, according to General Shelton, the president became irate and said, how many times do I have to tell you we are not going after Iraq right this minute? We're going to go after the people we know that did this to us. Do you understand me? I think he did after that. I have a couple of bullets around intelligence. Let me speak to that very quickly. And in fact, not only in the, the, the bullet on intelligence, but at the bottom it talks about the uh, CTC, the uh, Counterterrorism Center. They, it indicates they may have sources, sources throughout, throughout Afghanistan. But as Robert Grenier, the Islamabad station chief, pointed out, there was a difference between sources in the north and those in the south. 
Those in the North were cooperative and willing to fight the Taliban. The ones in the South were less apt to expose themselves for fear uh, of their lives and their families. Now more on that later. I'm going to play about 25, 20, first 25 seconds of the president's uh, 7 October address to the nation. Uh, in fact, I think this is a, a tremendous address. He, he covers an awful lot of things here, and I'll, I'll summarize those on the right after I play the first part of this. Good afternoon. On my orders, the United States military has begun strikes against al-Qaeda terrorist training camps and military installations of the Taliban regime in Afghanistan. These carefully targeted actions are designed to disrupt the use of Afghanistan as a terrorist base of operations and to attack the military capability of the Taliban regime. Okay, I'm gonna stop it there and just cover some things very quickly. Of course, the mission was to get bin Laden, but the purpose again, disrupt the use of Afghanistan as a terrorist base of operation. We've heard that before. We also heard that in Iraq. Alliances and coalitions, more than 40 countries in the Middle East, Africa, Europe, and across Asia, granting whether it was uh, forces to support or just simply you know, uh, air transit or landing rights, very important. He talks about the name of today's military operations is, is enduring freedom. We focus on Afghanistan, but the battle is much broader. It really is a global war, and he speaks to the global war on terrorism. Now, when we think of the elements of national power, we think of the acronym DIME, diplomacy, information, military, and economics. The president expanded that to include finance, intelligence, and law enforcement, and that's reflected in the 2018 National Defense Strategy. International and national authorities. Uh, when we talk about international authorities, he speaks to the UN Security Council Resolution 1368, condemning the 11 September terrorist acts. Uh, another one is Article 5 of NATO, which uh, uh, an attack on one is an attack on all. And when we talk about national authorities, the one thing that's put in much debate today still is that Joint Resolution 23 authorizing the president uh, to use all necessary and appropriate force against those who were involved in the terrorist attacks that occurred on 11 September. So we still have that today. And of course, as you know, it's still, still very controversial in, 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 uh, in Congress. Let me play a short clip by General Franks because we talk about Mazar and, and he's the one that focused, focused so much on, Desar, on Mazar. And it was a conflict between CIA and DOD or, or let's say General Franks on where, where we would put the resources and the people. So let me play this real quick. Uh, Mazar Sharif was an important fight for us because it was the fight that opened the land bridge to Central Asia to the north and uh, provided the first glimmer of hope to uh, not, not only the Northern Alliance, but to a great many people in Afghanistan. Of course, there's a number of other things, and I've listed them there. Political center of North Afghanistan, controlled the lines, those locks uh, to the northern province in the west and the east, as well as down south uh, through the Panjshir into, into Kabul. Uh, the airfield at Mazar was, uh, could accommodate heavy lift aircraft, and it's close to Karshi Khanabad, which really uh, links back to what he was saying. It, it, it gives us a land bridge to Central Asia. But let me add a couple other things here that, that, uh, that he doesn't talk about. General Frank's emphasis on Mazar became a point of contention with the CIA, as did General Frank's support to Dostum versus CIA's emphasis on supporting Fahim Khan in the Panjshir area. In fact, Gary Schroen, the leader of the NALT, the Northern Alliance liaison team, or called, some called Jawbreaker, who had deployed to Afghanistan on 26, 26 September to link up with the Northern Alliance, visualized two fronts based on where he felt the majority of Taliban were located. One of the fronts was located north to south from Tajikistan to north of Kabul. He called that the Tagra Front. And the second running west to east from, the, from above Kabul over to Jalalabad called the Kabul Front, forming this L shape with a Panjshir Valley form, forming the heart of the territory. He didn't even mention Mazari Sharif. While General Frank's plan started in Mazar with priority of air support to General Dostum in that area. And talking to, and talking to General Frank's, he would tell you that he had trust in Dostum. He felt that he was one of his division commanders, that uh, he didn't have so much, tr so much trust in, in Fahim Khan that he had in Dostum. So Im Im important insight into the difference in, in, uh, in perspectives between CIA and, uh, and General Franks and how he ran business. Uh, 
Uh, in fact, now, in, in fact, at the beginning when uh, when uh, Mike had talked about being in Afghanistan, Mike, I wasn't in Afghanistan with Mark. Mark was there. He was the he was the leader of this ODA five nine five. Him and his other heroes among the among the twelve people. Uh, Mark, can you pick it up from here? Yes, thanks, Bill and Mike and the Army Heritage Foundation Center. Uh, appreciate you this opportunity to share a little bit about this historic unconventional warfare mission. 20 years ago tonight, uh, we were still very much in the early uh, phases of this mission. Uh, Bill has touched on the initial post 9-11 strategy uh, to match teams of CIA paramilitary officers with teams of Army Special Forces Green Berets like mine. The 5th Special Forces Group was designated as Task Force Dagger uh, to spearhead this, this liberation effort and the initial assault into Afghanistan. Uh, I want to talk about just Special Forces teams, in particular our mission in unconventional warfare. My particular team, that had been our training and focus and emphasis. Uh, but in conducting an unconventional warfare mission, uh, you are to work by, with, or through surrogates uh, to conduct that mission. In the case, as my team started to study about the area, that would be to work with General Abdul Rashid Dostum of the Uzbek militia faction and to work with the Tajiks, Commander Atta, and the Hazara faction leader, Commander Moakek. Uh, we had a 12-man team. We'll talk about more about that, but uh, uh, how we operated in such a decentralized manner that's still pretty historic to Special Forces operations even today. Uh, one of the key things I want to talk about is prior to 9-11, our particular detachment, I had spent two months on that team uh, deploying into the CENTCOM theater uh, with ODA 595 prior to Jord uh, prior to 9-11, and we had conducted missions into Jordan, Kuwait, Uzbekistan, uh, where our counterparts in 2000, when we were there for nearly six months, were already in a heavy fight uh, with Al-Qaeda affiliates uh, in the form of the Islamic movement of Uzbekistan. And then we had also conducted various uh, U.S.-based training exercises. The mission that we actually received was for Special Forces Operational Detachment Alpha 595, to conduct unconventional warfare in support of General Dostum in order to render the unconventional warfare operational area unsafe for Taliban and terrorist organizations. That is verbatim what our mission was. I will tell you that the they didn't even uh, box us in. I could go anywhere initially uh, in Afghanistan that General Dostum felt we needed to go to accomplish that mission. The concept of the operation is our team uh, would receive the mission and, and uh, uh, be prepared 48 hours later to infiltrate by special operations helicopter, specifically by an MH-47 uh, platform piloted by the crew of the 160th uh, Night Stalkers. Uh, we would be inserted and link up with our CIA teammates and the armed militia resistance forces. Uh, but that concept was to support General Dostum and these other regional resistance commanders in their fight versus the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. Uh, foremost in that was to conduct intelligence collection and an assessment of these militia forces capabilities. Uh, we were then to help organize these resistance forces, coordinate air resupply and orchestrate any close air support and provide any humanitarian aid that we could throughout our campaign. As we rallied these militia factions together, uh, in building that militia army, uh, we had to get additional personnel and follow on special forces teams inserted. Uh, that initially came in the form of two Air Force Special Operations uh, Combat Controllers, two JTACs came in uh, after my team had already been on the ground about 10 days. Uh, and they helped augment our team significantly. And then uh, as again, as we conducted an area command meeting and got these full actions to agree to cooperate together, we then were able to uh, get two additional special forces teams on the ground to help support those specific factions. Next slide, please. 
So let's back up just a second and talk about Karshi Khanabad. That was the then secret base uh, in southern Uzbekistan uh, where Task Force Dagger uh, that was built around the 5th Special Forces Group as well as various Air Force Special Operations components and other Army Special Operations components uh, would gather there. Uh, our team actually received our mission on September 14th at Fort Campbell. Uh, and within about a week, uh, deployed out. We did not isolate at Fort Campbell, which is typical of most SF teams. Our isolation occurred forward at Karshi Kanabat. By the, the October 5th, uh, we had landed in Karshi Kanabat and uh, began to support the buildup of forces there. As we walked off the aircraft, we actually were met by the Uzbek Spetsnaz officers that we had trained uh, the less than a year prior. The initial plan, there was so much unknown about the situation as our sergeants began to do uh, an area study. There were so many questions that were unanswered as we submitted them up through the intelligence channels. No answers were forthcoming in the substance and detail that we needed, but we recognized that, you know, someone's got to be sent in and we let our chain of command know, send me, send us. We're the team that is comfortable with this ambiguity, ambiguity and that uh, uh, we want, want this mission. We can do it. Uh, that initial plan uh, was they, didn't ex they expected us to insert and work to build up a militia army, and they didn't expect to see us for up to six months. They expected us to winter up in the mountains and then come down in the spring to, out of the mountains to support other U.S. Army and Marine conventional force objectives anticipated to be in those cities. Uh, but there was immense political pressure from the White House through the Secretary of Defense uh, and the Pentagon commanders uh, right down to Colonel John Mahollin, the fifth group commander. Uh, there was no shortage of, of pundits and speculation on what needed to be done. Uh, our commander did an incredible job of filtering the majority of that from us. Uh, when our team finally received the specifics of where we'd be going, uh, we had a final 48 hours. Uh, that's when we entered into isolation. We only really knew A to B. We're going to get on that MH-47 helicopter. We're going to have at least a four-hour uh, flight, and it's going to include probably multiple aerial refuelings. We're going to fly across uh, uh, potential uh, former Soviet republic's borders. Uh, and so those air defenses are going to have to be coordinated so we pass safely through them. And we'll finally insert into uh, northern Afghanistan where we will meet uh, a CIA teammate on the, the landing zone. And then they will introduce us to General Dostum. But that commander's mission intent uh, was that we were to secure the Mazari Sharif airfield. Uh, again, open-ended. I could go anywhere in the country we deemed General Dostum needed to go to support those objectives, but they really wanted us to try to uh, seize the airfield outside of Mazari Sharif. Uh, they wanted us to open the landline of communication north to Uzbekistan, and then we had uh, the permissions to kill or capture Taliban and Al-Qaeda wherever we encountered them. We were to Everybody on the team understood the commander's intent and we would work through our problem solving skills and just work to gather that intelligence, uh, that fire hose of information once we were on the ground that we received from the local commanders and we would uh, write countless reports and send that up advising higher on the situation on the ground. Uh, in the middle of that, our sergeants would be coordinating uh, countless aerial resupplies that would come in literally every night of lethal, non-lethal, and humanitarian aid, cold weather gear. Uh, then we would also uh, be conducting and coordinating close air support, tied in closely with the maneuver forces to hold any of the gains. Next slide, please. 17 October 2001, the 160th prepares to infiltrate two Special Forces A-teams to join with Northern Alliance fighters and coordinate their attacks. Each team is a regionally oriented multilingual unit 
consisting of 12 highly skilled soldiers who are cross-trained and extremely adaptable. So let's talk about that 12-man team uh, that I had the honor of commanding uh, for nearly two years prior to 9-11. On September 10th, I had just completed those two years deploying half a dozen times uh, and had been moved off the team into the uh, battalion S3 shop. On September 14th, our team was notified uh, by our commanders that we would be the first 12-man team deployed out from the then 45 teams that were manned in the 5th Special Forces Group based at Fort Campbell, Kentucky. On that particular ODA, our average age was 32. We averaged eight years' time in service. Five out of the 12 were already Special Forces combat advisors. Uh, nine out of the 12 were Special Operations Sniper qualified. 10 out of the 12 were married. Nine out of the couples had two or more kids. Uh, we were uh, heavily cross-trained in unconventional warfare. Our team had trained to break down in a cellular structure um, beyond the normal six-man sections that a Special Forces team is typically equipped and manned to perform. We uh, had further cross-trained uh, to work in a two, three, or four-man cell and uh, pushed our guys to be trained to the point uh, that they could, we could send them out by themselves if we needed to. On that 12-man team, you've got a captain, you've got a warrant officer, a master sergeant, the senior E8 on the team, and then uh, the next senior NCO that is the intelligence and operations sergeant. The four of us make up the leadership on that team. The other guy, eight guys on that team are comprised of four different military occupational skills. There are two uh, weapons sergeants. There are two communications sergeants, two engineers, and two medical specialists. Now, Green Berets, as part of our training and pipeline, are also taught languages. In the case of our team, myself and two other of my sergeants had uh, basic military Russian that we received in a six month course at that time at Fort Bragg. Several of the sergeants, because of their repeated deployments into the Middle East, were also uh, fluent Arabic speakers. And then we had a Dari uh, speaker as, and a French speaker as well. The language skills and the cultural abilities and, and awareness is what sets special forces apart from some of our other special operations brothers and sisters. So after we've watched that first Department of Defense case study video clip about our insertion, we're going to now watch a second little clip, if you would, please, Bill. At 0200 hours, the unarmed MH-47 drops ODA-595 at LZ Albatross. Through the night, Tiger II waits for General Dostum. He is known as a brutal warlord who has made and broken alliances with many factions. What will the morning bring? The answer comes in a burst of hoofbeats. First, about 20 horsemen came galloping up, their arm to the teeth, uh, looking pretty rough. You know, the heavy beards, your typical Soviet, small arms, it's what they possessed, uh, light machine guns, AK-47s, RPGs, and they, and about 10 minutes behind them, uh, another 30 horsemen arrived with General Dostum. To their relief, they receive a warm welcome and follow the horsemen to Dostum's headquarters, a four-hour ride deep into the mountains. Only one member of ODA 595 is an experienced rider. It was an incredible, I mean, we were going up stuff that, you know, a foot wide, you know, you're a thousand feet up on a cliff that you knew if you fell, you were dead. This was our first chapter in the Wild Wild West events that we would participate in every day. So from that very first meeting with General Dostum and, and linking up with the CIA team, everybody remember how united our country was on September 12, 2001, in the weeks and months and even years following? Well, that was very prevalent on the ground. It did not matter what intelligence agency you were from. It did not matter what military unit or rank you were. It was, we are all Americans and we are here working together. We've been handed this enormous challenging mission and it was what rules and authorities do you have to help us collectively work against this complex problem uh, that we've been handed. So 
Uh, the oh. Afghans knew us only uh, by Commander uh, Mark or Commander Steve or Commander Bob. Uh, so it was incredible working with that CIA team. Uh, we'll touch more on them uh, as we go through this. But uh, after that very first period of daylight, that very first morning, General Dostum, in that footage you just saw, uh, come riding up. And we had a quick meeting, if you would. Uh, and out of that meeting, six of us mounted horses for the first time and began uh, a movement following General Dostum's main body with our packs on uh, other horses or donkeys to following behind us, while Chief Warrant Officer uh, Bob Pennington would remain with Master Sergeant Evans uh, there at the insertion. They'd been, begin to conduct the area assessment uh, and other intelligence collection activities around the area of our insertion. I want to just touch on, you know, we had, you know, we talked about our training a lot over the years. We felt we had some of the best training in preparing us for this mission. But back in 2001, on 9-11, none of our special operations community were really being trained in how to ride horseback. And it's just by pure fate, I grew up on a Kansas cattle ranch in high school uh, and competing at the collegiate level in rodeo. Uh, so I suddenly found myself as trail boss uh, advising my guys in how to ride horseback in combat for the first time. Is anybody, you know, Army Heritage question here. Does anybody recall the prior to 9-11, the last time the U.S. Army rode horses in combat? It was in 1942 in the Pacific Theater when a Lieutenant Edwin Ramsey led a cavalry troop of Filipino scouts in the 26th Cavalry in a horse-mounted attack against the Japanese infantry. So we are figuring out, you know, how do you carry your rifle? Literally at the trot or the gallop. What gear do you leave on your back? What can I leave behind? And you're trying to figure out, can I trust the people that I just met? Is there an ambush up ahead? There's mines. And then we have this half wild stallion that we're all trying to get comfortable with uh, in that situation. So if you would, please, Bill, switch to the next slide, please. So that is the special, our 595 team. Uh, meeting with our CIA counterparts and General Dostum that very first morning as he laid out this incredible hand-drawn tactical map that was laid out with Russian symbology, uh, which we could understand, depicting uh, the enemy and friendly forces in Russian military symbology. That was greatly helpful. Uh, we, you know, through the case study that was conducted uh, about this incredible historic mission, you know, we laid out to the task organization there with General Dostum, Commander Atta, Commander Moakek, uh, and then some of the main faction leaders uh, underneath General Dostum, Lal, Kamal, and Commander Ahmed Khan. You can imagine the reports that we are sending up uh, and trying to describe the situation that we are faced with. We had stepped back in time. We have a 19th century force on horseback. They are armed with the 20th century weapons, AK-47s, PK machine guns. Their, their largest weapon was uh, a rocket grenade launcher. Uh, that initial uh, couple days, we observed over 300 horsemen uh, attack uh, against armored tanks and artillery. And uh, as I sent up those messages, uh, it still wasn't really painting the picture until one day uh, out of frustration when they were questioning why we had not made some progress after only 10 days on the ground. Again, this was when the political pressure had, had reached down to the tactical level. Uh, when I basically was asked, why haven't we got to Mazari Sharif yet? Uh, after an impromptu battle, I was tired, cold, and hungry, and at night on a mountainside, I wrote a very candid report of, I'm advising a man on how to best employ light infantry and horse-mounted cavalry in the attack against armored mechanized vehicles and artillery, and I reminded our commanders, we basically haven't done this since the invention of the machine gun, and that report 
uh, is verbatim in the monograph. It's uh, next slide, please. I mentioned that, that that six of us first split out and uh, after our first day's battle, we recognized uh, that we can win. Well, we've got to do something even riskier and we split our six man section into two three man cells and we sent those three guys out uh you know at the last point i saw them we had given them every bit of water and uh the remaining radio batteries and ammunition and they rode away from me with about 20 militia horsemen as their security and i did not physically see them again for 14 days and about 70 miles further north as they rode into the battle at the pass with nearly 300 uh, militia horsemen uh, uh, gathered around them on the 9th of November. But that three-man cell would be how we would task organize. We would get those two Air Force combat controllers brought in, those two JTACs. That gave us five satellite-capable radios, and our team restructured as a task organization into the Tiger 02 cells, Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, and Delta. And we would match each of these three three man cells with an Afghan commander that would have between 300 to 750 militia fighters. And we would geographically disperse them in what would be different counties. And I mentioned that uh, that first three man cell, Tiger 02 Alpha, was sent the furthest and deepest, and they were 14 days on their own, calling in their own resupply drops uh, and calling in their own close air support up there. But the unit of measure between these four three-man cells that one of my special forces communication sergeants and I had the dubious privilege of riding back and forth between these cells with the resistance leadership, that unit of measure was a seven to 24 hour horse ride. Next slide, please. We would have that aerial armada of aircraft coming in overhead. We had F-18s off of two naval aircraft carriers. We had F-16 and F-15s coming out of the Gulf Coast countries. And we had B-52s coming out of Diego Garcia. Uh, just incredible amount of aircraft overhead. Uh, our team probably still holds a record for employing nearly 300 airstrikes in 24 days. This is what we were striking. The Taliban and Al-Qaeda uh, had their, their Northern Army there, uh, commanded by Amula Razak, backed up by Amula Nuri and Amula Fazl, uh, who was the chief of staff of their army. As we became successful in the valley, and taking some of the villages, liberating some of those areas and destroying their heavy armor and tanks. And then the horsemen closing up uh, into the villages. We are credited with destroying the Taliban army of the north that, that reinforced into that valley. And that Tiger 02 Alpha cell got deep into the enemy's rear and found their POL dump and were able to destroy it. So all those rolling armored vehicles soon became pillboxes. We slammed the door shut on that valley so that they couldn't reinforce and they could not escape. Next slide, please. At 1630, General Dostum receives word that Mullah Razak was indeed killed in the earlier strike. Dostum prepares to attack the bunker complex. Tiger II Bravo coordinates with a flight of F-18s to strike four targets in succession. Bombs in the air, they order a cavalry charge. So then out of nowhere, uh, precision guided bombs began to land on Taliban and Al-Qaeda positions. The explosions were deafening and the timing so precise that as the soldiers described it, hundreds of Afghan horsemen literally came riding out of the smoke, coming down on the enemy in clouds of dusk and flying shrapnel. That day on the plains of Afghanistan, the 19th century met the 21st century, and they defeated a dangerous and determined adversary, a remarkable achievement. The real magic of what we did on the ground there was not the B-52 strike that you see depicted there. It was not 
the 300 sorties, in my opinion. It was not all of the cargo aircraft that were coming in at night, the MC-130s and the C-17s dropping the lethal and non-lethal and humanitarian aid. The real magic of what our team did by having that presence there is we gave them hope. We represented the U.S. government. It didn't matter whether you are a Green Beret sergeant, an officer, or a CIA officer. You represented the commitment of the U.S. government and the willingness to support that ally in this complex mission. By being on the ground there, the real magic was uniting these different competing faction leaders and bringing them together in an area commander's meeting several days. That occurred on the 27th and 28th of October. Out of that meeting, General Dostum then pledged nearly 3,000 militia fighters. Our team was familiar with them. We had gone into battle every day since hitting the ground with different elements of, of his faction. We also had worked closely and met several times with, with Commander Atta and Commander Moakek. And by bringing those other two militia factions on board, it gave us nearly 5,000 militia fighters in total. And we worked to orchestrate an uprising across the north, six northern provinces. We had to get more help in. And that's when the other two special forces teams came in, ODA 534 and then ODC 53, that was a command and control element. By linking in with the local populace, they were able to help answer all those questions that we did not have the information or knowledge for. We were the human intelligence collection sensors on the ground, our team and the CIA. As we met with these various commanders, it was a fire hose of information about the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. And we worked to orchestrate that, write it up, and send it up to our hire so that they would help shape their strategy and policy. Next slide, please. I'm not going to go into this in detail. We had uh, uh, some close calls, as that last video clip uh, touched on. Uh, we had some danger close calls with fire support. We nearly had some, some uh, blue on green calls, uh, but miraculously, uh, we, we did not injure, uh, in one particular instance, any of our friendly forces. Uh, we also nearly lost the Tiger 02 cell when they were uh, nearly surrounded, encircled, and nearly cut off. And they had to call in close airstrike in danger close. And the JTAC that was positioned with them did an incredible job. We actually had strike aircraft come down and make gun runs on several occasions throughout this. The next slide, please. So this is one of the case study slides that gives a roll up of all the different types of aircraft uh, and ordnance that were dropped in there, uh, as well as 160th bringing in uh, the additional personnel, as well as uh, uh, critical team equipment resupply. Uh, several times they flew in additional equipment uh, laser target designators and those personnel as well as cash. And yes, we even employed two of the BL uh, Blue 82s uh, to, to launch our uprising across the Daria Souf in the northern provinces on the morning of the 5th of November. Next slide, please. Our team was successful in breaking through their defenses. And it was a horse race to Mazari Sharif. It was really a movement to contact uh, that our uh, handful of Green Berets on the ground, the handful of Americans helped to spearhead and coordinate uh, this movement. Uh, dozens of miles of fighting through several skirmishes, another battle at the, the pass south of Mazari Sharif uh, on the 9th of November. But then on the 10th of November, we liberated Mazari Sharif. And we rode into the outskirts to the fortress known as Kuala Jengi. Uh, throughout the next transition, we no longer needed the horses, uh, where we had actually had horse feed airdrop to us in the mountains. Uh, now we finally got those ATVs uh, and SUVs that we'd been asking for. Uh, the saddles that we'd been asking for for over 24 days uh, finally arrived, and we were no longer riding horses. Uh, but our militia army of thousands of horsemen now had captured tanks and motorized vehicles. 
And we actually, we called this, we went from the Wild West phase to now the Mad Max phase, uh, where we were conducted uh, mounted operations with armored and uh, mechanized vehicles. And we conducted uh, another 45 days. We call it the Mad Max phase, 45 days of operations across the northern provinces before our team was then transitioned, rotated out back to Karshi Kanabat. The photo in the lower right I want to talk about is we need the local help in getting the airfield uh, bomb damage repaired. So through local contacts, we were able to get heavy equipment and dozers and got that airfield repaired so that C-130s could start to land there. Uh, but then in a particular meeting that that image depicts, uh, we met on the bridge connecting Hyraton and Termez with the Uzbek Intelligence Service, their version of the KGB. And they thanked us for helping them uh, to fight against the Islamic movement of Uzbekistan. Throughout this phase then, uh, we had several other interesting encounters. We began to encounter media on the battlefield in the middle of operations. And we had uh, uh, the young American uh, Al-Qaeda operative, John Walker Lynn, depicted there as well. We found him on the battlefield, uh, and he later would go to trial and has subsequently served uh, uh, his term and been released. Uh, throughout that period also in the upper right, uh, the first casualty uh, in the war on terror would happen. Our CIA teammate, uh, former Marine Captain Johnny Michael Spann, would be killed by Al-Qaeda operatives that John Walker Lind was affiliated with that had feigned surrender uh, in an attempt to recapture mazar sharif So I'm going to conclude this portion of, of my presentation there, and I'll let Bill take it. There we go. You know, when Bob, when Mark, Bob, and I started this project, we realized in using the seven phases of unconventional warfare that we weren't finished uh, when completing the story of Mazar and had to cover other events to address this transition. There are different opinions on when that transition occurred and what it consisted of. In order to cover all of those opinions, we selected the end point of the transition to be June of 2002 when Hamid Karzai was chosen as the interim president of a transitional administration by Loya Jerga. In doing so, there were a lot of historic and heroic events, particularly in the South, that took place during that period that are only summarized in the book and not even mentioned in this brief. Having said that, let me summarize events and challenges in the South in the next two slides so we can get through this transition portion. The picture on the right is a uh, chief of station, Robert, Robert uh, Grenier, chief of station in, in Islamabad. And of course, we, we, we really had two sections here. We had the South, we've, we've taken, Mark took care of the North, but still we, still we had to uh, worry about the South and the Pashtun. On 9-11, Robert Grenier was the, was the station chief and responsible for all U.S. clandestine intelligence activities in both Pakistan and Taliban-controlled Afghanistan, fully 90% of the country. According to Grenier, it was an anomaly to have CTC, that's the counter, that's the counterterrorism center at, uh, at Langley, desk-bound headquarters case officers assert prim primacy in the north, and normally those contacts in the north would have been maintained by an overseas outpost, perhaps in Central Asia. Now, the reason why Grenier was running the clandestine efforts in the south is because his station in, in Islamabad was the closest and most involved station in those operations since there was no U.S. embassy in, in Afghanistan itself. Now, according to him, thus the CTC, what he called the CTC versus the Islamabad, or Northern Alliance versus Southern Strategy Dynamic, and as he described it, during the weeks and days following 9-11, his team met tirelessly with tribal leaders and warlords to determine their positions and incentives to fighting the Taliban. In most cases, they were not willing to cross that line until they had a better understanding of the risk versus gain. After all, the United States had abandoned them before. Now, as, as, we, as we look at some of, the, some of the differences here, of course, the, the, you know, the top bullet talks about uh, it was a Southern problem and had to be solved in the South without interference and support from the North. He was very much concerned, in fact, let me hit this next bullet at the bottom, 
perception that any Northern Alliance or Tajik Uzbek Hazar alliance against Pashtun territory would unite the Pashtuns against the invaders. Very concerned, very concerned about that. Uh, he outlined some of the some of the differences between the South and the North. Uh, again, uh, I think I said at the beginning where, where they talked about having a hundred hundred sources uh, across the various various tribes and provinces that uh, that they were they were they were very different in the South as they were in the North because they were so cautious in the South to expose any any Taliban uh, sentiments until they re were assured of U.S. support. But the, popul the population centers, ratio, culture, and ethnicity were very different as well. Uh, Pashtun means Afghan, Afghan and the Pashtun have dominated the Afghan political scene for the last 200 years. They mostly speak Pashtu. They're primarily Sunni Muslim, which is what they call Pashtun Wali, which literally means the way of the Pashtun. Pashtun Wali provides the basis for tribal life, emphasizing rules of behavior to include honor and shame, law, governance, as a communal society, relationships are extremely important and emphasize hospitality and the use of the tribal jirga or council to be able to reconcile, reconcile differences and provide group decisions. So, so you saw a very, very different uh, uh, ethnicity in the South as you did versus the Tajik, Hazara, and Uzbek in the North. Challenges in the South. Finding a credible Pashtun any Taliban leader willing to lead an uprising. At the beginning, they saw Karzai, Haq, and Shirzai, but Haq was killed, uh, killed in, in October of 2001, so he fell off the list. In between, when you look at, uh, when you look at uh, Karzai and, 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 and Shirzai, uh, we found that uh, they found that Karzai was far more polished and credible and also a senior leader of the Poplazai tribe of the Durrani Confederation. Having said that, Shirzai had been the governor of Kandahar and uh, it was one of the leaders, certainly one of the leaders in the, in the Pashtun community. Uh, another thing that, and, and we'll come back to that later because Karzai was then chosen to, to run this, this transitional government. Of course, a lack, a lack of sanctuaries in the South for organizing and training a resistance force, uh, not like you, you had in the North, potential that the Pashtun as a community, however unlikely, that it might seem because of this consensus building process they went, went through would unite against a perceived invader. And of course, that's what, uh, that's what Grenier was so, so, sorry, so concerned about, that uh, they would see that anything from the Northern Alliance coming south would be perceived as an invader, and they would, that would unite the, 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 the Pashtun community. Uh, I list these, in, in fact, I would suggest that the Grenier has a great book, book out. I think uh, Blem, Eric Blem has a great book out to talk about well, they talk about 574, but also 583 with Harry Sims and 574 with Jason Amarine and, and his, his ODA and the support they provided to Sherazai and Karzai, but uh, some tremendous books and they did some, some tremendous work down there. 7 December, Kandahar fell. Sherazai seized the, seized, seized the governor's palace, which he had prior to 9-11 uh, or, you know, now all of a sudden uh, when... Uh, he gets back into it, and then finally on 9 December, Karzai entered Kandahar. This is important because we talk about Kabul being the, the capital of the, of, the, of the country, but Kandahar was really the, the stronghold of the Pashtun, so it became very important. Let me move to the next one here on this transition. So, so, so what was important about transition? Two, two major considerations, the fall of the old government and the establishment of a new government, and how we walk this down, if you look at, I have at the top there, from UW, from unconventional warfare to foreign internal defense. And I'll get to the, I'll get to the uh, diagram in a second. But 13 November, the Northern Alliance, led by Bismula Khan, liberated Kabul again. So we see the fall of the old government when you talk about the capital. 5 December, Bond Agreement established an interim, an interim authority. So now you're seeing the, the, they're trying to build this legitimacy in a new, in a new government itself. 7 December, Kandahar fell. Uh, that became important, like I said, because it had been the, uh, the, the Pashtun stronghold. 22 December, Karzai was sworn in as Afghanistan's chairman for the admin, interim administration. You know, all these things now, building up a new government and tearing down the old one. This thing with uh, Operation Anaconda, this, this became uh, important because it was predominantly conventional forces. So we're seeing now that we're shifting, starting to shift from this unconventional warfare 
to uh, more of a traditional type warfare with the conventional forces being, being uh, coming in. Uh, after the conclusion of Operation Anaconda, Task Force Dagger and Task Force K-Bar, K-Bar stood down, deactivated, and the uh, CJ SOTA, the uh, Combined Joint Special Operations Task Force in Afghanistan, which uh, built around the 3rd Special Forces Group, was stood up. Although the UW mission was ongoing in some parts of the country, it started its transition to FID, or Foreign Internal Defense. Then on 1 May, 3rd Special Forces Group began training the 1st Battalion of recruits. And now we're talking about not just the militias that we were working with in unconventional warfare, but now actually trying to build up an Afghan National Army. And in June of 2002, we call that the ending point because now you've built up the legitimate government, you've torn down the old one, you've moved from UW into, into foreign internal defense. If you look at the uh, diagram on the right, again, those were the four elements of irregular warfare, uh, count, unconventional warfare being in the bottom right. Here you see unconventional warfare where it was support to the insurgency, but then this transition to foreign internal defense when you foreign internal defense when you talk about the friendly nation or supporting the friendly nation. Now they, of course, after that, then they had a coin, a counterinsurgency fight to make as well as counterterrorism. Uh, let me, uh, you know, some of these things I list successes, failures, and implications. And I've already talked, I've already talked to many of them. Let me just expand on a couple of them. Uh, number three, despite what appeared to be shown in the Nolts. Northern Alliance, uh, Northern Alliance liaison team's propensity to champion support for Fahim, Fahim Khan and the Panjshir. General Frank started with Mazari Sharif. Uh, you know, recall from an earlier discussion or comments I made that Trone didn't recognize the Mazari areas as one of the major fronts. However, General Franks was adamant about the strategic value of Mazari Sharif and focused resources, particularly air, to General Dostum early, General Dostum early in the campaign. Number five, interdependencies among the various groups were so critical that they could have become a, become a, a critical point of failure. And, and I, I list this though as a success. And I list this because you talk about the small teams, interdependencies and how important it was that they, uh, that they get along. So it's, it, it, they worked very well, a, a real success story as far as that was concerned. When I get over to, to, to failures, uh, important, Talk about lack of coordination between CIA and DOD on intelligence during the preparation phase. And one of the things we really recognized was getting that information down to the teams on the ground, being able to prep them. You know, Mark talked about, Mark talked about sending up these RFIs, requests for information as he was in the uh, ISAFAC isolation facility in Karshikhanabad and uh, no get, get, getting no response back. But, but something else that he had had realized when he talked to General Dostum is General Dostum had talked to the, some of the intelligence people and tried to pass stuff back so that they could they could enter this into the into the into the status of what was happening out there. So uh, a failure, a lesson learned is you know is is support forward. Get the get the information to the people who really need it uh, on the ground. DoD rice bowl. Uh, you know there were a couple things with DoD. Of course, number one, I already talked about the propensity to look to say Iraq was the problem, or, and the president finally saying to Wolfowitz, Iraq was maybe later, but not right now. But also uh, this bit about being in charge. You know, uh, Mark brought up the bit about being brothers out on the out on the battlefield. In fact, even General Franks, when we talked to him, said, "Hey, look, you know, when I flew in to Missouri Sharif, you couldn't tell you couldn't tell the CIA guys from the military. They were they were they were brothers out there on the battlefield." I don't know that that was exactly it at the top when you talk about the relationship between uh, between Rumsfeld and between Tenet. Tenet was 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 very amiable about it. He handled it very well, I think. And uh, finally, a memo was drafted up on who would be in charge at what times to appease uh, to appease Rumsfeld. So so anyway, I listed <laughs> certainly listed that as a failure. Implications: There had not been a joint publication on unconventional warfare until finally in 2015, and of course. It included the initial OEF Operation Enduring Freedom efforts as un unconventional warfare examples. The expansion of SOFT and in particular the addition of the 4th Battalion, the Jedbergs, to the Special Forces groups. Revamping of, of, of training. Uh, one, of the, uh, one, of the, one, of, one of the people I have a lot of respect for is a, uh, uh, is a Conrad Troutman, the longest sitting J-2 the intelligence officer at US SOCOM, had been a SOFT Intel Brigade commander during that time. 
and later as a J2, he wrote a book on soft intelligence guiding the tip of the spear, where he made a number of recommendations to push intelligence down, down to the soft teams, some which were executed. And so, so he had the power to revamp some of the training that was taking place to be able to do those things in reorganization. And I certainly uh, implications for interagency relationships, and, and, and that gets into how important it was for them to be able to work together to get things done. Let me pass this. Let me pass this back to Mark to talk about reflections. Uh, in fact, let me, yeah, reflections, kind of in the epilogue, he kind of kind of walks through what happened afterwards with the team. So Mark, it's all yours. So I want to, I want to touch on uh, from that very first morning uh, on October 20th, 2001. And in the days uh, following, you know, Dostum continued to present his plan uh, how that Mazari Sharif was the key to liberating Kabul. Uh, but then backing up from that, it was here in the Dari Yusuf, we have to get through this village and then that village and then the Sholgara. That is the key. Uh, uh, the, the district center of Sholgara was the key to then getting into Mazari Sharif with Mazar Sharif being the key to the northern liberation of the northern provinces, which then would get you Kabul, which would then get you Kandahar and the rest of the country. So our main mission was to help understand that plan and help convey that up through the military and intelligence uh, channels, uh, and then to help resource and support that plan. Uh, 20 years ago today, uh, I was in the Dari Asuf, at our second guerrilla base camp, uh, working with our newly arrived uh, battalion commander and battalion S3, uh, helping take them on a leader's reconnaissance across the battlefield, meeting with three of the four different <laughs> subordinate commanders and helping them to understand the situation that, that we had developed uh, and the plan we were about to implement by kicking off an uprising on the morning of the 5th of November across the six northern provinces. And this, these actions by outlying militia factions all had the intended effect of rising up, tying down, pinning down Taliban and Al-Qaeda units in other provinces to isolate Mazari Sharif. We were successful in that. Uh, on the morning of the 10th of November, uh, that militia army of Dostum, Ada, and Moakek, and nearly 5,000 militia fighters, and uh, uh, just uh, about uh, uh, less than 45 Americans, uh, liberated the major city of Mazari Sharif on the 10th of November. Uh, we rode into the streets to cheering crowds of them um, uh, that had turned out to celebrate their leaders in toppling the Taliban regime and Al-Qaeda and sending them on the run. Uh, that mission and that uh, uprising across the northern provinces is considered the catalyst for toppling the Taliban regime. It emboldened Fahim Khan over in the Panjashir north of Kabul. Uh, it emboldened other militia groups in the south and in the east, we, you know, even the eastern alliance around Jalalabad it emboldened them to rise up and fight against the Taliban and Al-Qaeda in these other cities. And less than uh, half a dozen special forces teams were instrumental in being in this phase. And less than the first 90 days after 9-11, we had toppled the Taliban regime and put Al-Qaeda on the run. Uh, this study, this mission, and the other teams that performed incredibly throughout this phase just demonstrate the power of our special forces, the impact they have as strategic battlefield multipliers, the power of these small teams cross-trained resource with satellite communications that allow me to talk to Colonel Mulholland in another country. It allowed me to talk to logisticians back at Fort Campbell, Kentucky. It allowed me to talk to uh, General Franks' staff at MacDill Air Force Base. Uh, but by working through that commander's intent with centralized planning, decentralized execution. Every guy on that team understood the commander's intent, the purpose, the end state, and the strategic effects we were working to achieve. The same half a dozen teams 
from the 5th Special Forces were then withdrawn. Our team then was back at Fort Campbell by February, uh, and we were ordered to reset and prepare already for pending operations uh, to help with the liberation of Iraq. I had been moved on to another specialty unit, uh, but the same Corps 595 NCOs and the Chief Warrant Officer were still together. And the 595 team and those other half a dozen Special Forces teams helped spearhead operations into southern Iraq uh, and participate in that liberation. I want to talk about the, the guys on that team. I'm so proud of them. They are my heroes. Every, you know, these guys outside of, uh, we lost one teammate, which I'll touch on, but we had six of the NCOs. They, we all stayed in active service, in short, is what I'm saying. Uh, eight of these guys went on to become team sergeants themselves with multiple deployments to Iraq, to Kurdistan. Uh, uh, two of these teams played instrumental roles in the Al-Anbar awakening, turning the Iraqi Sunni tribes against Al-Qaeda. Uh, but then the, these guys also went on, two of them went on to participate in, uh, after 2011, back in operations in northern Iraq, in Kurdistan, and in Syria. Uh, two of these guys became sergeant majors at the company and task force level for both operations in Iraq and Syria. Two of them retired with 30 years of service. Uh, and a couple of us uh, went into continued reserve service in their broader SF or SOF community. Uh, next slide, please. I want to touch about uh, uh, in the conduct of that mission on November 25th, uh, is when Mike Spann was killed during that Al-Qaeda uprising at Kuala Jangi. Uh, but then in Iraq, uh, Sergeant First Class Bill Bennett, just two weeks from the 595 team redeploying home, uh, Sergeant Bennett was killed in our Ramadi, Iraq, uh, in a direct action raid. Bill was one of those three sergeants that were 14 days on their own. They gave us the time and space to unite these different ethnic factions and build up that militia army and were instrumental in the success of this team's mission, spearheading America's response to the attacks of 9-11, along with the other teams from Task Force Dagger. We're honored and humbled that there actually is the America's Response Monument, inspired by images of our Special Forces team on the battlefield. And it is known as the Diapresso Le Bear the Special Forces Monument, uh, the, that motto is to free the oppressed. And it is an incredible 18-foot bronze that sits in Liberty Park overlooking the National 9-11 Memorial, known informally as the Horse Soldier Statue. Next slide, please. So what happened to the key Afghan figures? You know, they went on uh, to participate in the political process they were disarmed and demobilized. Uh, I've been back a number of times in both uniform uh, as a defense contractor and as a private American citizen doing humanitarian effort. And I was proud to interact with uh, some of uh, the special forces teams on the ground that were uh, over the years uh, instrumental in that process. And just a few weeks ago, I was very proud to meet with one of the 10th special forces group ODAs that was the last special forces team in Northern Afghanistan prior, right prior to the collapse of the Afghan government. General Dostum became elected vice president in, in President Ghani's first administration, and then he stepped down. Uh, Commander Atta served repeatedly as the elected governor of Balkh province. Uh, Mohammed Moakek uh, served in various positions at the national ministry level and in various political positions within their parliament and, and their ministries. But over the years, over these 20 years, it became very evident, uh, especially in that first five to 10 year period, how the US State Department and the Karzai administration were working very deliberately to marginalize these different ethnic factions in the North that were instrumental in America's success in toppling the Taliban regime they were marginalized in favor of technocrats and a centralized government approach versus creating traditional strong local and provincial governments such as our own American history 
that was based on strong city, county, and state government. Uh, and I want to touch on, you know, a number of the interpreters reached out several years ago, uh, you know, and they all experienced over three years waiting for their special immigrant visa approvals uh, before they came to the states. And then, yes, now I've been become involved in helping to get our remaining interpreters uh, evacuated uh, from Afghanistan. And by the grace of God, we were successful in getting a number of them out to American soil tonight with their families. Next slide, please. <clears throat> I want to touch on this. Uh, our team, I personally laid hands on Mullah Fazl and Mullah uh, Nori. They were detained by ODA 595. And then later, uh, these five Taliban leaders uh, were, were exchanged uh, for Sergeant Bergdahl. And then with the toppling of the Afghan government, both Mullah Fazl and Mullah Nori have returned back to the very positions they were in when I took them off the battlefield 20 years ago. Next slide, please. If you want to learn more about this period, I, I point, Bill mentioned several great books about those other special forces teams uh, in the South there and by uh, Mr. Grenier's book that's uh, deep, deeply insightful about the activities in the southern part of Afghanistan. But in the northern part of Af Afghanistan, the books, The Horse Soldiers, The Last Warlord, uh, which is a personal favorite uh, because it's the Afghan perspective. The Last Warlord, to me, is everything our team did not know about the interaction, the human dynamics, the human terrain that our team was thrust into. It is everything we did not know going into that mission, that history of rivalries and alliances. And then there's the CIA accounts, the books First In and Jawbreaker. And then, next slide, please. There's also a documentary film that was Emmy nominated. It's called Legion of Brothers. And it showcases uh, an overview of the three different special forces teams that were instrumental in that first 90 days after, uh, spearheading America's response both from two of the teams conducting unconventional warfare missions, the 595 team, and then the 574 team. And then one of the, the special forces units that with unique capabilities from Task Force KBAR that was instrumental in, in killing and capturing uh, Al-Qaeda and Taliban leadership. That's all in a 90-minute Legion of Brothers Emmy-nominated documentary film. And then I want to then, of course, there's the Hollywood version 12 strong that came out in 2018. Next slide, please. <clears throat> you know, after years of being encouraged to do this, uh, Chief Warrant Officer Bob Pennington and I, along with uh, the incredible best-selling author Jim DeFelice, we're going to publish our own book entitled Swords of Lightning, and that'll be out in uh, late May of 2022. There's also another documentary film that we participated in coming out soon called The Pasha. Look for that one as well. It is deeply insightful uh, about General Dostum as well. Next slide. So <clears throat> we managed to survive our careers. Uh, depicted in the upper right corner there is uh, after countless deployments and, and uh, nearly 30 years uh, for Chief Warrant Officer Bob Pennington in the Army. Uh, you know, a lifelong friend. Uh, we're, I'm proud to say we're now business partners in this incredible uh, veteran-owned uh, craft bourbon distillery, American Freedom Distillery, based in St. Petersburg, Florida. And our number one product is our award-winning Horse Soldier Bourbon. So please check us out, horsesoldierbourbon.com. We are distributed in Virginia. Uh, that's the closest as you are, along with 13 other states. Uh, I'll leave it at that. Check us out, please, horsesoldierbourbon.com. Next slide, please. Uh, we're ready to, to move into yeah, the question. Yeah, that's it, Mark. That's yep. it. I would ask if it's a smooth bourbon. <laughs> Why, yes. Yes, it is. <laughs> of course it is. <laughs> uh, folks, if you have questions, uh, please use the question and answer uh, icon, and then I'll uh, read them off to... Uh, uh, to Bill and Mark. 
Uh, first question is not a question, of course. It's a commentary. Uh, it's from a John. He says, please pass to Mark my appreciation for citing Ed Ramsey as the last uh, prior U.S. commander to have led a mounted charge in 1942. I'm proud to have been a friend of Ed's. And in 2014, we discussed Mark's action with 595 and compared them to Ed's actions. You know, Literally, I did a former, uh, this is as a former member of Task Force Dagger, who was at K2 and an OGA rep from December uh, 01 to February 02. Great presentation. So I guess you must be good friends with John. Um, I don't believe we've met, but thank oh. you, John Harris. I look forward to meeting you. And I do deeply regret that I did not uh, get to personally meet uh, Lieutenant Edwin Ramsey. You know, I will touch on uh, his troop after receiving, he was awarded the Silver Star for that action, uh, but it was part of the Baton Corregidor campaign. And several weeks later, after that battle and that cavalry charge, they were faced with the tough decision whether to surrender as part of the, the army in Baton and Corregidor there or flee into the jungle. And Lieutenant Edwin Ramsey and some of his cavalry troopers fled into the jungle. Lieutenant Ramsey linked up with the Philippine resistance. Uh, he helped to provide intelligence and organize them, uh, reporting to General MacArthur. Uh, miraculously, he s survived World War II and was made, uh, he went on to serve and was a colonel by the end of World War II. And he is an honorary member of the Special Forces Regiment. So I thank you uh, for that shout out, Mr. Harris. I look forward to meeting you sometime in the future. Uh, this question comes from Roger. You cite hope and commitment as being the magic that made things work. In view of our recent disengagement or abandonment of Afghan allies, do you think this could be done again if needed? Roger, that's, that is definitely a tough question. I, you know, I don't know. Uh, can it be done again? I know they are desperate for uh, support in there. There just simply is not the U.S. political uh, will to help arm and equip the resistance that is fighting in there. Uh, from local sources on the ground, you know, the Taliban is putting out that it is ISIS-K that is battling or conducting some attacks across the country. Perhaps it is. Uh, my sources on the ground indicate that is actually the Afghan special forces that we help to train and equip who are being actively hunted down and slaughtered that have risen up and conducted uh, the most recent attacks there in Kabul uh, because that's where a number of the Afghan security forces were being tortured and killed. So it is some of our allies that we left on the battlefield and it's a hard, hard pill to swallow that we abandoned the very people that stood beside us 20 years ago after 9-11 uh, when America needed their help. Uh, it, is, it is tough. It's a tough topic right now uh, for me personally because I am still in touch with a number of the people on the ground in there. But there is not the political uh, nor military will right now uh, to help arm and equip them. Uh, this next question comes from Bob who served as an advisor in Vietnam. Uh, he wants to know, what did you see as the major errors in the operations over the past 20 years that led to the disengagement this past summer? You know, they, they had uh, enormous challenges. There's no doubt. Uh, but the people I've met with repeatedly would tell you that they, you know, prior to the collapse of the government there in, in July and August of this year, uh, that they, even with the problems they had with corruption and other things, that the government and the average person was far better off with the educational opportunities, uh, with uh, human rights, women's rights and education and other things uh, than they were during the previous reign of the Taliban. Uh, what's happened now to me is it's not America. Uh, it's stunning. I suspect that at some point as Afghanistan may degrade further into civil war again, uh, the U.S. is going to have to make a decision. Are we going to continue to sit on the sidelines or are we going to get involved again? But from what I witnessed, having an American 
advisor or representative on the ground, as you know, sir, from Vietnam, that provides a measurable hope and demonstrates commitment. Let, let me add to that, Mike. Hey, uh, I was in Vietnam in 68 with part of the uh, Fung Wong or the Phoenix program as, as kind of an advisor as well, although I would tell you they knew more about this stuff than I did. But having said that, you know, I mean, I think two, two likenesses certainly are uh, all of a sudden we decided we weren't going to do it anymore. And I think that happened in Vietnam, and I think that's exactly what happened here. We just decided we weren't going to do it anymore, and uh, to our loss, uh, in just simply uh, folding up the tent and leaving. So, so kind of my two cents worth. Uh, Bill, I'll ask you, since you, you focus more on some of the doctrinal aspects. You, you talk about finally DOD publishing uh, doctrine in, what, 2015. Yeah. Did we have something wrong with the doctrine? Well, you know, that's one of the things we looked at. We thought, in fact, when, you know, Bob had worked uh, doctrine at, uh, at, I guess, SWIX. Is that right, right, Mark? Yes. We working the doctrine piece. And so we thought, hey, let's take a look at the, let's, you know, in, in general, because we didn't want to get into anything very sensitive. But uh, uh, generally, we wanted to look at the, uh, the definition of the unconventional warfare, and we wanted to look at the seven phases. And we found it to be pretty workable. I think the only thing that I saw different uh, is I think congressionally when they defined unconventional warfare, instead of saying uh, underground auxiliary and guerrilla forces in the congressional description, they said, or guerrilla forces. I mean, so it gave it a little bit more lead way. And I think I probably appreciated the congressional definition better, but no, we found it, we found it workable. You know, the funny thing is, you know, of course, the army has always been kind of the executive on unconventional warfare because they, they got it. Uh, having, Having said that, uh, the joint doctrine, the first one ever published uh, on unconventional warfare was in the 25th, was the 2015 one. There was an article I, on the early bird this morning that uh, talked about um, as they move special for operation forces to a more conventional environment, how do you retain uh, the capabilities that we've developed over the last 20 years? Is that a concern that you have? I really mark, well, both of you, because you're somewhat involved with community, is that a concern that we're focusing so much now on a big war that we'll lose the little war capabilities again? You know, I've, uh, I want to, I guess, touch on a couple things of, you know, it, you know, General Scott Miller, it had drawn down to several thousand folks there. Uh, you know, over 20 years, these special forces groups from 10th group, 3rd group, 7th group, primarily, uh, had borne the brunt of these rotations repeatedly into Afghanistan. You had the most combat experienced and culturally attuned force that was ordered out. And in calling some of my peers, uh, I was shocked to learn that not a single ODA had been left back for contingencies. And, uh, and then when we had to go in and rescue our citizens that were abandoned on the battlefield, Again, those most culturally attuned and combat experienced units were not brought back in to help with that evacuation. And in that frustration, you know, I, I talked with several uh, senior commanders and the contingencies were put forward uh, to our higher uh, national military leadership. And, uh, you know, even I had to be reminded, Mark, we answer to the civilian authorities our political authorities. And that is what makes American military unique and exceptional. And we don't always have to like it. It is a tough pill to swallow. I'll transition to your question. Uh, I spent uh, several years recently as a, a contractor at the Special Operations Command helping coordinate assessments for our, our specialty skills. And we spent several sessions talking about near peer competition. Uh, and the role of our special operations community in that. Uh, I will tell you that the way we fight now is far different than how my team fought 20 years ago. I will tell you then, right after 9-11, with the political emphasis, our team entire operations order consisted of about two pages. I kind of summarized that tongue in cheek of A to B and we have the authorities and permissions to figure out how to get to that end state, get to Z. 
uh, our mission was accomplished 100% off of human intelligence derived on the ground by the CIA team and my special forces team. There were no UAVs or tactical intelligence surveillance reconnaissance assets overhead. We never, never had full motion video or electronic warfare uh, tactical support. Uh, even bringing in some of our uh, uh, tactical ground-based SIGINT collectors was something we've talked about we probably should have done, but we did not have that. That mission was 100% human intelligence driven. The way we fight now with UAVs and these various ISR assets overhead nearly 24-7, in my opinion, the biggest challenge in a near-peer competition is going to be the commanders who have become reliant upon that nearly near real-time intelligence that they're going to have to go back to a commander's intent. They're going to have to get these teams briefed and launch them in there. They're going to have to resource them, support them, uh, and those teams will make communication when they're able to uh, because if it's a near real-time signal with a near-peer comp competitor, we're going to have some challenges, and those teams may be compromised. Not to mention now uh, the, the leveraging the cyber and our IT capabilities. Uh, so warfare has definitely changed. Uh, and we started to see glimpses of that as the Taliban government uh, or the Taliban took over from the Afghan government and some of these uh, near peer uh, capabilities entered into the battlefield as America withdrew. Uh, Pakistan, uh, Iran, uh, China. Uh, and Russian teams uh, reportedly on the ground uh, in there. Uh, so it's definitely a hybrid warfare approach uh, as they work to uh, uh, leverage their capabilities uh, in that environment now. But uh, uh, I know the folks at Special Operations Command, again, I don't speak for them, but they are uh, working diligently uh, to train and prepare these teams uh, with their unique capabilities for those potential contingencies. Okay. Well, I, I just, uh, one more uh, editorial comment from Andy, who uh, wants to pass to Mark and all the uh, members of the 595 uh, and all the green brace, thanks. And uh, also from uh, a mutual icon, uh, Jack Sinlaw. Um, I guess uh, his compliments to you uh, on your articulation tonight of these complex subjects. I uh, want to wrap it up a little bit. Uh, Bill, Mark, do you have any closing comments you'd like to make? No, I'd, I'd like to thank you for inviting us in to be able to talk about this. We think it's certainly important and, uh, and not to be forgotten. Mark? I just, I just thank you the opportunity to share a little bit of insight into this, this incredible mission uh, with this, this monograph uh, that we finally got published uh, with the help of Institute Bill and the Institute for Defense Analysis, going way back to that defense case study, and then finally with the, the Joint Special Operations Unity University uh, supporting its publication. Uh, unfortunately, the timing of its release uh, perhaps was was too late. But uh, well, as I said, you. yeah, I, I found it. I think this summer is when when it got when it got published. Yes, but I, I want to thank you both uh, for. Uh, for coming on uh, online tonight uh, to talk about a subject that I think, uh, as you indicated, we may need to, to reconsider in the future. Uh, I also want to thank, because uh, uh, I, I guess it is a sensitive subject. Uh, we have friends here in the community that are working with some of their, we have uh, Army War College students that were from Afghanistan that people are still trying to get out uh, to, uh, and, and into safety again and, and we'll talk soon thank you okay thank you Bye.